Well, I'm, I'm really very honored to be invited to this um, very interesting, broad-ranging conference. Um, it's really been tremendously welcoming, probably too welcoming if my head has anything to say about <laughs> what I'm, what's been going on of the evening. Um, and like Anne, my vo I've, not, I've, uh, I've had more conversations over the last few days than I've had over the last few years, really. Um, uh, um, and I, I'm in the rather, I think, very fortunate position of being moderately healthy uh, whilst being actually very old. Um, um, and I'm starting to take advantage of that by looking back on, it's actually over half a century um, as, as an academic and trying to make sense of what it is um, that we contribute as, uh, as psychologists. Um, uh, and so for this, this talk, I wanted to explore how psychology makes an impact and deliberately uh, to use this, um, this slightly ambiguous uh, exploration of, of uh, psychology counting. Um, uh, as you'll probably gather, I'm speaking at half the speed that everybody else in this conference. Um, so I, I hope you don't nod off because you're not getting the input quite quickly enough. Um, and, and one of the thoughts that led me to, to think about, to e explore this was um, the discussions about um, weapons of mass destruction. Because I was brought up um, doing my psychology degree in the 60s um, with the idea that psychology is indeed a, a science like physics, chemistry, biology. It's, it's a hard-nosed science um, and indeed measurement is very much part of that. And uh, thinking about that, it occurred to me, you know, physics has nuclear weapons, biology has all sorts of nasty things that they can spread around the world, um, chemistry has, has all sorts of toxins and things. I mean, they've, they've actually done it. They've got weapons of mass destruction. Where are the psychologists' weapons of mass destruction? What are you guys doing? Um, um, and it made me wonder how psychology can be dangerous and how it makes its contributions um, to, uh, to the to world, to policy, uh, to issues, as well as um, helping individuals. And um, this particularly struck me within the context of, of offender profiling. Um, the, the, unfortunately, the whole sort of imagery of uh, advising the police uh, in relation to criminal activity um, has um, such a dominant sort of mythology around it um, that it's something I've been fighting against really for the last 30 years, ever since um, I contributed to a major police investigation and the police were terribly keen to use the public relations of, um, they were using the latest science and they were using a professor to solve crimes and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, people not realizing that actually that is hooking into the certain the Sherlock Holmes narrative of the individual who's uh, a bit dodgy outside of the system, who comes in and does things that the police can't do. Um, and so that the imagery developed, that the way in which psychology contributes across a wide range of things is um, by having the individual, I hope you like this, I bought the hat specially, um, 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 that the individual um, actually comes in and solves the, the, the crime um, in a way that, or, or contributes uh, directly from that, their particular expertise. And as, as a scientist, as a, a professional psychologist, over the years, I've become ever more convinced that psychology operates in quite a different way. And when involved in police investigations, which I really don't have anything much to do with these days, um, that I used to be asked at which stage in an investigation should you bring in the psychologist? And my answer has always been before the crime is committed. It's, it's actually the 
insights and the understanding of criminal behavior and criminal activity and of, indeed of police decision making and of a whole range of other issues that are, relation, are re relevant to investigations. It's that's how psychology contributes. And that actually a much better um, way of thinking about it is psychology is, develops understandings and systems and procedures and those uh, find their way into um, the whole decision-making and policy formulating process. And so what I want to do today is to draw on some of those, those ideas about the way in which psychology um, can be applied, uh, just looking back on various things I've got drawn into um, uh, that uh, Co uh, the, 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 that last whiskey was a real killer, actually. Um, 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 so, really, what, an interesting model that I've developed over the years, a very simple idea that really comes from scientific method, is the notion that, that all those applications have... Um, issues to do with the information available, because as psychologists we work a lot with information and structuring it and organizing it. Um, issues to do with uh, models of how you can use that information to actually move forward and to develop inferences. And then a, a crucial issue that it took me a long time to realize, actually turning that into something that people uh, can act on. I did a huge study some years ago about prison design. I, we, we actually did questionnaire surveys of how satisfied prisoners were uh, with their prisons. Um, and proved very interesting. And I produced this thick document with lots of multidimensional scaling and uh, all sorts of uh, statistics in it and so on, um, and handed this to the Home Office who'd commissioned me, thinking, here's the results, you can sort it out. They, of course, the architects and civil servants and all the people involved just put it on the shelf. Um, they didn't know what to do with it. And I had this sort of naivety um, and a sort of false humility that as the individual involved in that process, um, I, I didn't re it wasn't really my role or my, I didn't have the expertise to turn it into some sort of actual guidance system, um, something that people could actually uh, make use of. And in, in subsequent years, I've begun to move much more towards how do you s actually convert what you're thinking about and doing as a psychologist into something uh, that people can work with. So I'll take some examples um, from these three areas uh, that I've ended up being involved in, in many, often in quite sort of accidental ways, um, that illustrate these sort of processes. Um, the, um, these deal with um, experimental support for, for different ways of thinking about uh, psychological processes, how we develop conceptual models, and how powerful they can be um, in terms of an, influencing people and policies, um, the development of, of actual support systems for decision making and how they hook into um, psychological theories. Um, and the first one I, I want to deal with um, relates to um, research um, on, on witness testimony. Um, the, the intriguing thing here is that um, generally speaking, I'm, I'm very critical of experimental procedures in psychology. It comes from my background in environmental psychology where it became very clear very early on that you can't actually model an environment in a laboratory because you have a laboratory environment and the reactions you get there are the reactions you get to the context in the, in the laboratory. Right, no matter what pictures you show people, they're not actually playing the role in that particular context. And I was very struck yesterday, uh, yesterday by Steven Pinker uh, talking about his, exper his experimental study with abstract um, cards that you had to make uh, judgments on and showing that people did that rather badly, but when you gave them some real context, they did it rather effectively. Uh, he didn't take from that 
what I would take from it, which was that the abstract cards were pretty well irrelevant, and that that sort of process is a total distortion of the way we deal with the world, and that therefore any sort of set, uh, there's a huge range of cognitive psychology studies using those sorts of models, and they miss the point that we work with the world in a whole variety of different ways and, and relate to them in, in relation to the particular context um, that we're part of. But there are certain situations that are actually rather like laboratory experiments um, in which it is possible to do some quite interesting research. And the example that I, I'll give, it derives from the eyewitness testimony that was used as part of the case um, in relation to the Lockerbie bombing. Um, you, may be, you may remember that in, um, it, some years ago, um, a, a, a plane, a, an American aircraft blew up over Lockerbie in Scotland, um, killing uh, 240 people on board and, 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 the, and all the crew. And what happened was that um, the police, and in fact major governments, because it was the American uh, the Americans were determined to get some sort of conviction, and particularly Hillary Clinton, who was, um, the, I think, the, the, whatever they call the foreign secretary there at the time. Um, and the, uh, but it, it was carried out by the Scottish police, because that's where the plane c came down. And they were determined to find um, the, the individual and, and get a guilty plea. And what they did was that they, round the bomb, they found some uh, clothing that they had worked out um, had probably been bought um, from a shop in Malta. And they, um, they were convinced that um, the, a, a man called Al Magrahi um, had bought that clothing. Now, the bomb occurred um, some, a, about a year after they, uh, they thought that clothing had been bought, which was a, a, a sort of the Christmas of a year earlier. Um, and they approached the shopkeeper, Gauch, Gauchi, and um, they asked him to remember who had bought this clothing a year earlier. Now, there's a whole range of issues around the, that, those memory issues. Um, and we did a, a very detailed report that is available online. But the one particular aspect of it, from a psychological experimental point of view, was that they showed Gauchi this set of photographs and asked him which one was the person who bought the clothing a year earlier. Can you tell which one is the, is the terrorist? Um, Gauchi actually identified Al Magrahi, and I was brought in by Al Magrahi's. Uh, Al Magrahi, Magrahi was convicted, and I and he wanted to appeal his conviction. Um, in fact, ten years later, it went to trial, and Gauchi again said that it was Al Magrahi who had bought those, that clothing. I um, I was called in by Magrahi's defence. To, to do a report on all this um, uh, in relation to the evidence that was presented. And one of the things that I'd always been very interested in was what's known as experimenter effect, which is a, a particularly in relation to social psychology studies in which the experimenter influences the outcome uh, quite inadvertently. So what we, what we thought we'd do in, in, for this defense, we were given these, this, these foils, as they're called. We, well, I had this actual document. And what we did is we set up uh, a study um, following this um, in which we basically had, uh, to begin with, a small-scale study. We had two experimenters um, uh, who had different conditions. And in one condition, uh, that we, we, we got individuals who said, we want you to run an experiment to see if people can tell from these foils um, who, who the culprit is. Um, and in one study, we said, 
Uh, we didn't give them any, any clues at all. And in the other study, we said, oh, by the way, it, it is number eight, but of course you mustn't tell people that. And that was really the only difference um, in, in the conditions um, that we gave people. And, uh, so, that, um, so that there were those two different setups. And the results were quite remarkable. When they knew who the suspect was, 20 people um, were a, out of 40 were able to identify um, al-Magrahi. Um, when they didn't know who it was, it was actually, it, w it was only, it w none of them could actually spot who it was. Um, and, and subsequently, in fact, a, a, a PhD student um, took this on board um, law, um, a, and did a much larger scale study where we had higher levels of, of blindness and double blindness in terms of the experiment. Um, and in, in that case, in 25% of the cases, the informed, in, uh, the, the experiment in which the experimenter was informed, they got the right guy. In the other case, it was actually slightly less than a, than a chance. So we were able to demonstrate that this process, which is well established in areas of psychology, um, really was operating in relation to the um, to the judgment of those of those pictures, um, and uh, were able uh, to make that as part of the report. What we discovered later was that the police, um, after they'd got Gauchi to identi identify Al Magrahi from the photographs. The police had a party to celebrate that they now had the evidence they needed to take forward. So you can see there was a huge pressure on the process. Although they did, we don't think they deliberately um, fiddled it in any way. Um, uh, this was the Scottish police. Um, the, um, <laughs> they, um, the, the, the pressure on them to get that uh, solution must have given all sorts of nonverbal indicators and to, that we know exists uh, very powerfully. Um, um, so th that was one example of where you can, se uh, which there have been a number over the years, where you can set up these sort of careful studies to, that's, that are, are drawing upon existing um, psychological understanding and perspective um, in relation to, in this case, dealing with the information that is available. And it has huge Im implications for eyewitness testimony and, and a whole range of contexts in which that sort of decision is being made. The second example I, I want to take, want to mention, um, relates to um, how a, f a framework of thinking about things um, can have an influence on judgments. And this related um, to uh, prison conditions um, in Scotland in which a number of individuals were bringing cases um, against um, the Scottish prison authorities under human rights legislation. This was in those golden days when Britain was still in the European Union. Um, um, when we, we actually had human rights legislation that was really quite civilized. Um, um, uh, so the, uh, under, the, under human rights le legislation, there is a prohib prohibition on inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. And they were arguing that, this, that the conditions in these prisons, um, the sl particularly the process of slopping out, where you have to take the, the bucket with the ojo from the night soil uh, um, along to a, a toilet where it's, it's flushed away, um, which is open to all sorts of, of disgusting uh, smells and, and all sorts of abuse from prisoners banging into each other and all sorts of things. Um, and we wanted to argue, again I was brought in by the complainant, um, he wanted to argue that his conditions were inhuman and degrading. And an important point was he was not arguing that it, it, that it was a form of torture in the normal sense and that he was physically abused or, or that it caused mental uh, concerns. He was just trying to argue that it was inhuman. And the interesting thing is, how do you get a grip on the experiences 
in a prison, particularly in a prison cell, where in, in those days there were two people in cells that were initially designed for one. They had to sh share the same bucket in the corner um, for any toilet activities. How, how do you actually um, give a framework for thinking about that? And I, I was called in, and I, uh, I was called in because of my earlier work um, in, in architecture and the development of um, the way of thinking about our experiences of places. And in 1977, I uh, published a book called The Psychology of Place. Um, that I'm, I'm working on a second edition thinking I'll just tidy it up and discover there's a huge literature over the last 40 years. Um, and it's a real challenge to actually produce a second edition. But the, the thing is that, that I argued that there was a, a framework of how we make sense and, and utilize places um, in which the pattern of activity that goes on there uh, relates to the different sort of experiences we have and the things we're trying to achieve. And that a domestic framework uh, actually includes a number of different components um, that we very deliberately organized to be separate from each other, and that within the, these cells, it was impossible to do that. So I use the term brutalizing in the sense that it was the sort of things that you, perhaps an animal, a brute, uh, would be expected to do. Um, and so um, I, I, I gave an analysis of the experience of the prisoner around this psychological model of what the nature of places are. Um, and quite interestingly, the judge um, um, came uh, and started citing that model in his evidence, um, supporting um, the argument within the cell, the lack of opportunity to create appropriate places for activity, uh, most last, notably the lack of a distinct place for excretion and associated watching facilities, the sharing of the cell, um, creating a, a lack of personal space and an inability uh, to create some sort of territory. All, all of those issues that the, um, the, the judge draw on, as well as other aspects relating to overcrowding and the uncertainty of the environment, um, um, uh, led to the, the, that's consistent with the impact and actually that they upheld that these conditions were illegal. Um, a little... Um, a I, and that was, that, that was a very interesting case, and on the back of that, I got asked to, um, to contribute some other cases. And one of those was, I suppose it must have been four or five years ago, as I keep saying to people, you think things are two or three years ago, then you've got to add two years on for not, and nothing happened, having happened. Um, so it must be about five years ago, I got called in to do a similar case in relation um, to uh, Mountjoy Prison. I, I have to comment... Only in Ireland could you have a prison called Mountjoy. Um, <laughs> um, I, I love the fact, you know, in Britain, when we had telephone, telephone pages, um, where the, the pages that had all the businesses in were called the yellow pages. In Ireland, they're called the golden pages. <laughs> yeah, the, the use of English is wonderful. Um, so... Um, uh, so, the, the, um, and the, 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 the Mountjoy case five years ago, I still don't know what the outcome is, and I don't think they even paid me travel expenses yet. Um, 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 so that, that is an, an exa fascinating example of how ways of thinking about the, the context, drawing upon psychological ideas, can actually influence f fairly major judicial decisions. Um, uh, and uh, the, the third area that I wanted to just illustrate is the, this idea of decision support. Um, and in, in the criminal context, over the years, um, we, from the very earliest case I got involved in, um, there was a, um, a, a, an awareness that were crimes occurred, um, the... Um, that carries implications for the, for the locations and understanding of the criminal. And this again comes out of the environmental psychology background where we build mental models of, uh, of the environment that helps us to understand what's possible were. And that relates uh, to familiarity. Um, and the 
uh, th th this idea um, of the location a, a, an offender chooses to commit a crime actually carries information about uh, what he knows, what his experiences are. Uh, I say he because the great, as most of the young women will know here, that most of the troubles in the world are caused by young men. Um, the, um, the, 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 he, where he knows, um, what, what he knows and where, where the opportunities for crime are, 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 are related to his, to his experiences. Um, and so um, there's, we, the, the, we've done a lot of work around this now. It's one area of criminality where you have a reasonably precise context. So you can actually build models around that. Um, because when you're dealing with crime scenes, um, you know, it's a much more open area of, to make it make sense of or, or victim statements. But when you've got the location of a crime, um, at least you can start um, exploring the mathematics behind that and uh, within this idea of people making sense of their of their surroundings and this we've we've done uh, there's been a lot of publications around that now um, um, uh, and as i say this draws upon um, these ideas uh, that we had when we explored um, or you know non-criminal experience of of cities um, and of finding the way around and, and making judgments and building mental representations. And one example that illustrates this was we, uh, I did some interviews with criminals where I uh, do something that we did a lot in environmental psychology, particularly in the early days, um, in which I said, draw me a map uh, of where you committed your crimes and indicate where the crimes were. And this... Um, the crosses here are where this guy committed burglaries. So you can see he was a very busy chap. Um, um, and it's, it, it's, it's really very interesting in, in showing a sort of a, a coherent structure in relation to the area in which he was operating. Um, here is a police station, and he wouldn't go past that because coming back from a crime, presumably with stolen goods, um, is when you're most vulnerable. Um, there were, there's an area up here, the DHSS is where he got his, uh, his payment, you know, his, his, his social security payment. Um, uh, th that was an outer limit. Here you can see that it moves off into another sort of area. Uh, and intriguingly, there's nothing um, on the other side of, of the canal. Um, and when we... Uh, uh, when we... Um, compare these, uh, this with an actual map, you can see the distortion in that that we find in all mental maps. That He's con conceptualizing it as a very simple crossroad with a parallel canal to the main road. And what that does is to bring his understanding of the area he's operating in into a much more clearly defined space. We can actually see that the the land use patterns are very different on the other side of the canal, um, very different sort of area to operate in. And we can see that he actually had a base here um, uh, from which he was moving out uh, to commit his, uh, his burglaries in that context. And that just illustrates the way in which, for some criminals, uh, understanding the opportunities for crime are structured around an uh, an understanding of, of what they have access to and what the possibilities are. And from that, uh, we started to try and think of through how you would build a, a decision support system that would actually facilitate um, making inferences about criminal activity from um, the crime locations. And, and two principles emerge um, that I give the rather grand terms to uh, propinquity and morphology. The, uh, one, of the thing, one of the common findings um, across um, studies of criminal, criminals uh, in general is that the, um, the further you get away from where the offender has a base, uh, the, the less frequent are the crimes. So there is a tendency, in fact, the average burglar in, in a number of different places, I, my guess is it would be the same 
in Ireland as it is in Britain, the average burglar doesn't go much more than a kilometre or two kilometres away from where they have a base. Um, there, is, there will be a tendency to not to do it too close to home because that's maybe where they're recognised or where, where they're more vulnerable. So that's the idea uh, of, uh, of propinquity, of what is known as a, a decay function. Um, the other issue is an intriguing one, um, which is that uh, if um, we look at the distance from any given crime and we put probabilities onto that, um, we could assume as you get further away from that crime, there's less chance that the offender has a base there. But if we do that for a number of different crimes, you can start to add that up. And this is just a schematic illustration of, of the mathematics. And you end up with a, 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 an area of probability um, that, that can be used to indicate um, where the offender might have a base. Um, and on the back of this idea, I developed a piece of software called Dragnet. A dragnet is a net that drags along the bottom of the sea to pick up all the, all the, the sort of rather nasty creatures that might be there. And so it, it, there was a great television series in the 60s that used this term, Dragnet. And I thought, you know, I, I came up with this and thought, perhaps I can develop some software from it and make my fortune only to discover that Sony had already trademarked Dragnet, another million I'd never made. Um, uh, um, and it, it really it was an interactive system that we developed for research purposes, actually, um, so that we could, mo we could modify the different models in order to see which were, the, were going to be the most effective. Um, it was only when some American, well, a Canadian who had developed a similar system insisted that we'd broken his, co his, um, tr his copyright, his trademark, his patent, uh, um, that we realized this ha may have some commercial value. We later discovered his patent was totally, um, uh, it, it really didn't work uh, um, when the lawyers got to grips with it because he'd already published all the stuff and it wasn't a patent. He never got a patent in Europe anyway. Um, but it made us realize that this was actually something quite, probably quite useful rather than just as a research tool. Um, uh, so, uh, this, um, the, this is an illustration of, of how this um, might be, uh, the, the, this sort of works. This is a, this is, um, a marauder in, in New Zealand who, um, who was sort of looking in windows and being very nasty about, um, about people he saw in that area. Um, and when you, when you put, just put it into this, this dragnet analysis, um, you end up with an indication of where the individual might have a base, and that indeed was where this guy, um, where, where, where his home was. That's just an illustration. Um, but the, the crucial point that has to be taken on board is that this is only in some cases um, that actually the, um, we find... In, in burglary, about in half of cases, this sort of model works. Actually, in serial killers and, and serial rapists, um, we, yeah, and you've got to really go to America if you want to get enough of those sorts of crimes. Um, they, they really have the most exotic serial killers uh, in America, um, and plenty of them, uh, which are always published widely, so you can, you've got a lot of data to work with. Uh, in that, something like uh, two-thirds of cases, this sort of model um, can actually operate. Um, so this, um, this just is yet another broad illustration of how you can take psychological ideas of making sense of areas and places, but you have to follow through with building into that checklists and uh, what decision support tools and, and various ways of converting it into something that, that, that people can, can actually work with and deal with. And it really, in terms of a research process, um, one of the things I um, wanted to draw attention to is um, the, the common assumption about applying psychology is that you have, you have the, the, act, uh, the research question um, 
and uh, you, you, you get some data, and then you, do, you have the results, and the results are fed into some sort of options for the decision makers um, that, that leads them to sort of get some information and, and to deal with the problem. Um, and, and I said, like in the initial photograph I, I showed, it's the idea that psychology has got its hand, hands off, and it's, um, it's just producing results um, that people can then sort of use. And I, I've formed the view over the years that really um, you, you have to structure the whole way of thinking about what you're dealing with in relation to the, the problem that people are facing. And I've often suggested that psychology really should only study topics that people outside of psychology consider to be important. Um, because psychologists, like all disciplines, can uh, uh, disappear, um, I, I suppose a lot, the polite term is down a rabbit hole, and enter their own sort of area of interest and, and the issues that they want to share with each other and, uh, and become, you know, they get their levels of significance and the, and the correlations and, then, and, and all the different sort of statistical procedures and they think that they're doing something useful because their, their colleagues um, in, in psychology think it's useful. Whereas I've over the years uh, th thought that actually the way in which you should think about it is you've got to look at what the research problem is. What is the issue um, that you're trying to deal with? And that should influence the actual way you formulate the question. Um, and then the information that you draw on has got to be useful um, to uh, that, the sort of context of the problem. Um, you know, in, in, in uh, the sort of criminal uh, investigative context, the idea that you, I mean, uh, criminals just don't leave completed MMPIs at the crime scene. Um, um, uh, the, the, for, I've, often, uh, I've often argued that you, you, you actually have to deal with the actions that occur and the information you have about that. Um, and that act then makes it actually much more amenable to being used as part of the process. So that the, uh, the options that emerge from that um, need to uh, really be the way in which you organize and conceptualize the results. Um, so that, um, that, that really gives you a sort of framework. So I, I wanted to end with um, another uh, study I was involved in that I think uh, brings a lot of these ideas together in, in relation to the, the challenge we're all living with uh, of climate change. Um, uh, I mean, there, there, there are some um, general discussions about um, the, the lack of response to climate change. And I feel very strongly that it's been dominated by the scientists saying you've got to have more information or by economists thinking you've got to adjust the economy. And there's been very little exploration of what the actual psychological issues are involved in people not responding, in all of us, not responding to climate change. And the, th the thing that drew my attention to this was the research we did many years ago on behavior in emergencies. Uh, did a, a lot of studies of uh, interviewing people and looking at um, accounts of what happened when a, when a building was on fire. And I got called in to a government inquiry into um, the uh, fire in King's Cross Underground Station in the center of London, uh, in which 31 people died. Um, I have to mention that when we first did the, uh, submitted the publication of this to um, an academic journal, one of the reviewers said that our, our numbers were too small to take account of the, uh, for, uh, uh, of, of the, the results we had. Um, fortunately, the editor th thought that this was a, a remarkably silly comment. Um, and my, this goes back to an idea in environmental psychology I've that I developed over time, which is that we, we shape our lives in relation to our understanding of what's going on in places. Um, it's uh, that, that there are rules of how we make use of places. It's an, when we walk into this room, there's no accident that you assume the speaker will be here and you'll all be sitting there looking forward. And the, 
that you'll expect the speaker to be reasonably animated and you'll expect to try and stay awake. That is actually part of the rules of the whole sort of process. Um, and these rules operate in all sorts of other contexts. And, and because I was called into this in, in, inquiry, again, unusual access to data uh, of relevance, um, I actually had information from the fire brigade of where the bodies were found, and I also had information from the, from the police who identified who these individuals were and where they were traveling. And um, I, I published this with a, a, an ex-student of mine, a colleague, uh, Ian Donald, and at the time I said, look, we, we've got to look at where they died and where they were going to, and he said he didn't believe this would be any use, and he, he, he he, he took his words back when we got the results. Um, um, that what, that this, the, this was the, the situation in which it occurred. Um, the fire took place on, the, on these escalators coming up into the ticket hall. Um, the police involved, it's a, three, it's a very complex three-dimensional structure, um, and the police involved had no... Um, uh, were taking people, the trains were, were going through, which is what they do in an emergency. The, the underground trains were just going straight through. They weren't taking people off, but the people already on the platform, the police officer was actually guiding them up the stairs into the ticket hall. Um, and, um, uh, and so they came into the ticket hall, um, uh, and the fire developed and smoke came into the ticket hall and, um, and it overtook the people and, and they got killed in that, that context. And as I say, we looked at where the bodies were found. In other words, where were the people traveling? The, the assumption might be that in this sort of dangerous situation, people would just sort of run wildly and try to get out. In fact, we know that people queued up at the ticket box uh, where, you know, where you had to put your ticket in to get out. People queued up there with smoke billowing uh, behind them. Um, and we know that from a lot of studies in, in emergencies in, uh, in buildings, that um, there, there will be a fire in a department store and people will queue up to pay for their goods before they're actually told to leave. And these rules of, of patterns of daily behavior are remarkably powerful. And when we looked at the... Um, at where the, the bodies were found and where people were going, we found there were some people found in this location who, had been, who would normally move this way. One of the interesting things about people on the London Underground is that they do it so often, they can literally find their way out in the dark. They're covered in smoke, but it's, a, it's the pattern that they normally take. Um, uh, the people, the bodies found here, they were going uh, in that direction. Uh, there was a person found along this corridor, um, and another, another person found um, along that corridor where they were going. In other words, uh, people were carrying on with their normal activity, um, uh, even when they were overcome by smoke and, and, and flames. And one of the interesting issues here, and this is, a, this is a graph I always like to show people, it's the only thing in psychology, I think, that you'll ever learn that could save your life. Um, and this is how we judge the development of emergencies. Um, what happens is that a typical example would be there would be a fire in the living room, or there would be smoldering on the couch from a cigarette that's been dropped. People will look at it and see it's a bit, a bit of a problem. They'll go out to, say, get a bucket of water, and come in, and then they may want to tell somebody, and they will assume that the development is actually a fairly stale, stable um, estimate of the growth. But in fact, um, that emergencies typically uh, grow... Uh, geometrically or, or exponentially. So that actually, in the early stages, you come back and you see the growth, and it's not too much. It's, mu it's, it's similar to what you expect. You come back a bit more, it's similar to what you expect. But in no time at all, it's much, much greater than you might have anticipated. And the, my point really is that we only change our behavior when the information 
comes to us that the rules, the, the social rules, the environmental roles that we have in a particular situation, the patterns of activity that we anticipate, it's when we now know that those rules are broken and that, we do, that we're no longer following that pattern of behavior, a different pattern of behavior is, is actually relevant. Um, and um, th when you look at disasters um, over, over time, um, you find the same thing over and over again. The, this was the, um, the, the Challenger sp um, spacecraft disaster. The, uh, the, the, this, I put this together some time ago, the Herald of Free Enterprise, um, the uh, Piper Alpha, um, all of these things, when you look into the details, there was advance warning of what was going on. It was the same with due, due of COVID. There was knowledge early on about what the problems were. In fact, there were people before COVID. I had a, a colleague who was a professor of biology who had, uh, in, in 2000 was all, already collecting masks and, and, and food stores and so on, saying there is going to be a, a pandemic. Um, so there were, there were, and in fact, in Britain, I was told 10 years before the pandemic, there had been a government committee planning how they would deal with the pandemic. All of that tends to be ignored. And in all of these cases, you find that the, um, uh, the that there are early warnings. It's very rare these days that there's a disaster that is um, not preceded by early warnings. Um, and you get it on a large scale. The, the, the massacres are in Rwanda. It, it took a long time for those to build up before people took any notice. Ukraine, people were saying, Russia's going to invade. And <laughs> nobody took any notice. Um, so, and the reason for that is not obstinacy or it's the fact that our daily lives are structured by social processes, social expectations, by minute to minute activities that hook us into the way we use um, the environment. And that's, that's what causes the inertia. And the, the inertia only stops when socially people say to each other, you're not going to fly again, are you? Um, or you're not going to have that extra drink and still drive home. It's only when that happens, and I did a big work, uh, study on uh, um, safety in industry, and it was when the workforce said, why isn't the manager turning up at the safety committee that they got rid of accidents in very dangerous working situation? It's those social processes. This is why I call myself an applied social psychologist, because the power of social interaction, in fact, a number of these uh, therapeutic studies at this conference has all been about how people helping each other changes things. I mean, we are social animals um, for what, actually one very simple reason, that a, a baby is uh, is vulnerable for at least two or three years, so you've got to have families, and, um, and that out of that whole social communities evolve and develop. Um, so it's, that's, what, that's what's holding us back, um, and will continue to hold us back until the impact is so obvious that we all know we're going to have to do something different. So um, uh, the, uh, the, when the question really I often ask is, um, can, so, can psychology uh, be dangerous? Um, and my answer is psychology is a very different sort of discipline. You, you, um, the, the things that, that are damaging are bad psychology, are, are ideas that are, are developed without a proper support for them, without um, uh, some sort of uh, evidence of, the, of their effectiveness. Um, that um, when, when it's fed into um, confidence tricks and, and the exploration of propaganda, um, it was very interesting that it became apparent that some members of the American Psychological Association were involved in helping to design torture in uh, Guantanamo Bay, and the American Psychological Association had a huge outcry about that, that that is not what psychology 
is about. And in fact, we know from other research that torture is not really very effective in achieving any sort of goals other than alienating uh, the victim. So really, in a way, uh, I see psychology as, a, a, as an antidote um, to m one of the, uh, many of the things that beset us in, in, in the modern world. Um, and really, th that, that's how psychology counts, is by um, contributing to those sort of issues. Um, and uh, a number of, I've written a number of, of popular books, um, much to my surprise, um, actually doing moderately well, um, as well as a, um, a, re a textbook. And, and I just want to pr uh, uh, promote my most recent book, which ha uh, has a slightly tongue-in-cheek title, Experiments in Antisocial Behaviour, um, but actually as a series of experiments for students who want to do studies in the forensic criminal area, but, don't, but it's very, very difficult for all sorts of ethical and practical reasons. So over the years, I've developed a number of studies um, that they can be involved in the, uh, with some examples da data and so on, um, so that they can actually do what is necessary to understand psychology, which is to collect data and analyze it. Thank you.